in Gibraltar, thousand years ago. Watching a woman with dark hair and piercing brown eyes scan the Mediterranean horizon. She's not human, not exactly. She's a Neanderthal part of a mysterious lineage that once thrived across Europe. Her name, let's say, is Lena, and her story is about to pull you into a world of ancient tribes' hidden divides in the fight for survival. Why did her people vanish? Were they so different from us? Stick with me for the next hour as we unravel the secrets of the Neanderthals, our ancient brothers and sisters, and discover what their lives teach us about our own. Hit that subscribe button, grab a snack, and let's dive in. I'm not just here to read you a history book. As someone who's spent years fascinated by human origins, I've poured over the latest research, walked dig sites, and even held replica Neanderthal tools. Today, we're exploring the Neanderthals through the lens of Lena, a fictional archaeologist I've created who's excavating a cave near Gibraltar in 25. Her discoveries mirror real-world findings, and her journey will tie together the science, the stories, and the big questions. This isn't just about bones and DNA. It's about what it means to be human. Neanderthals weren't the brutish cave dwellers of old cartoons. They were skilled hunters, toolmakers, and maybe even storytellers living from 400,000 to 40,000 years ago across Europe and parts of Asia. Picture Lena cuts at her dig site brushing dirt from a jawbone. She's thinking about how these people weren't one uniform group. Genetic studies like those from the Max Planck Institute show Neanderthals split into at least two major populations, one in Northern Inland Europe and another along the Mediterranean from Spain's Gibraltar to France's Rhone Valley. The Rhone River winding through France wasn't just a waterway, it might have been a cultural wall separating tribes with different customs tools or even languages. Why does this matter? Because it shows Neanderthals were complex like us. They weren't a monolith. The Northerners braving icy forests might have hunted mammoth with heavy spears, while Southerners like Lena's Gibraltar woman fished or gathered shellfish under sunnier skies. This divide wasn't just geographic. As Lena sifts through artifacts, she wonders, did these groups clash? Compete trade. The evidence is tantalizing but incomplete, like a half-finished puzzle. Let's talk about Lena's find a skull nicknamed Nana, unearthed in Gibraltar's Forbes Quarry in 1848. Nana's a big deal, not because she's the first Neanderthal ever found that came later in Germany's Neander Valley, but because her robust features, low forehead, heavy brow, ridges, wide nose, hint at an older, more archaic lineage. Studies suggest Nana's people living 50,000 years ago carried DNA linking them to Neanderthals from 100,000 years ago. That's wild. It's like finding a community today using Stone Age tech. Lena's obsessed with this idea were Nana's people, a relic clinging to old ways while classic Neanderthals up north evolved or even mingled with early modern humans. Here's where I get opinionated. The textbooks call Neanderthals less innovative because their Mysterian tools, chunky stone points, lack the finesse of modern humans' Chatel Peronian blades. But is that fair? Imagine Lena holding a Mysterian scraper. It's not flashy, but it's versatile, good for skinning deer, carving wood, or scraping hides. Neanderthals used these tools for 200,000 years. That's not failure, that's reliability. Maybe they didn't need fancy blades because their environment didn't demand it. Or maybe innovation isn't just about tools, it's about survival strategies like navigating harsh winters or sharing knowledge across tribes. Still, Lena's troubled by one thing Neanderthal tribes were small, maybe 850 people, max compared to 500 in modern hunter-gatherer groups. Obsidian, a volcanic glass used for tools, traveled up to 300 kilometers, showing they had networks. But small, isolated groups mean less genetic diversity. If a disease hit or the climate shifted, they were vulnerable. Lena wonders if this insularity doomed them, especially as modern humans, our ancestors rolled in with bigger groups and sharper tools. It's not just about brains or brawn, it's about adaptability. Let's zoom in on the North-South Divide. Lena's been reading about Thorin, a Neanderthal from Francis Grote Mandrin, near the Rhone. His DNA links him to Nana in Gibraltar 2,000 kilometers away. That's a huge range. It suggests a Mediterranean metapopulation, a web of tribes sharing genes and maybe culture. 
But Thorin's lineage is old archaic, even compared to the classic Neanderthals of Northern Europe, like those at La Chapelle, France. These classic folks might have had slightly softer features, possibly from interbreeding with the early modern humans. Lena's jaw drops when she reads that some Neanderthals had gene variants for blue or hazel eyes. Blue-eyed Neanderthals, that's not in the caveman stereotype. But the plot thickens. In northern Spain at El Cedrón, cave archaeologists found 13 Neanderthal seven adults, three teens, two kids, and an infant. The bones tell a grim story, cut marks, smashed skulls, marrow extracted, cannibalism likely by other Neanderthals. Lena's stomach churns as she imagines the scene. Was this desperation, ritual, or conflict between northern and southern tribes? The southerners, like Nana's people, had broader faces, taller, lower jaws, a distinct look. Could Thorin's group have clashed with Northerners maybe over territory? It's speculative, but the bones don't lie. Violence was part of Neanderthal life, just like ours. Picture the El Cedrone family 49,000 years ago. Lena's been studying their mitochondrial DNA, which shows a patrilocal setup. Men stayed with their birth group, but women came from outside. There's K.L., a young father, his brother Tor, and their cousin Varn, all sharing the same maternal lineage. K.L.'s wife Mira came from a distant tribe, her DNA different. Their kid's a teen daughter, a seven-year-old son, and a baby huddle in the cave, unaware of danger. One day, another group attacks. Maybe they're starving, or maybe it's revenge. The families killed their bones later, showing the brutal marks of cannibalism. This isn't just a story, it's based on El Cedrone's evidence. The three adult men shared one mitochondrial haplotype, but the four women had different ones. The baby and a juvenile, he matched one woman, likely their mom. This family wasn't just a random group. They were a unit like yours or mine. Lena's moved by their story. It reminds her of modern families displaced by conflict. Think of Syrian refugees or indigenous groups facing colonial violence. The Neanderthals' world wasn't so different, love loss and survival all etched in their bones. Another example hits closer to home. In 2019, I visited a museum in Spain displaying Neanderthal artifacts. A guide Maria shared how her grandfather, a farmer, found a stone tool in his field. It wasn't fancy, but tests dated it to 60,000 years ago. Maria teared up saying, it's like holding my ancestor's hand. That tool may be used by someone like Lena's Nana connected Maria to a past we all share. It's a reminder Neanderthals are not other. Their DNA lives in many of us, one, two percent in non-African populations. Lena's dig isn't just about science, it's personal. Lena's back at her Gibraltar cave, staring at Nana's skull. She's wrestling with the big question, why did Neanderthals disappear around 40,000 years ago? The science points to multiple culprits. First, they're small tribes, limited genetic diversity, making them less resilient to change. Second, modern humans, Homo sapiens, arrived in Europe bringing advanced tools and larger social networks. Competition for resources like deer or cave shelters was fierce. Third, climate change didn't help. The Ice Age's swings made food scarce, and Neanderthals built for cold struggled as forests shrank. But I've got a theory not in the papers, just my take. What if Neanderthals didn't fail, but merged interbreeding with modern humans means their genes didn't vanish. They blended into us. Lena's struck by this Nana's dark eyes, her sturdy frame live on in modern Europeans, subtly shaping our immune systems or even our looks. The out of Africa theory calls Neanderthals a dead end, but I disagree. They weren't a mistake. They were a chapter. Their extinction wasn't inevitable. It was a mix of bad luck, tough competition, and maybe a choice to join rather than fight. I mean, Lena imagines her on Gibraltar's rocky shores 50,000 years ago. The Mediterranean sparkles warm enough for a swim. Nana's skin olive or dark soaks up the sun. Her long, dark hair sways as she spears fish or gathers mussels. Her tribe, maybe 30 strong, shares a cave laughing over a fire. They're not primitive. They bury their dead, maybe with flowers as seen at Shanadar Cave in Iraq. They might have sung or told stories passing down knowledge. Nana's no noble savage. She's a survivor adapting to a world where lions and wolves lurk. What fascinates Lena is Nana's appearance. Geneticists say southern Neanderthals exposed to more sun, 
likely had darker pigmentation than Northerners. Nana's brown eyes and robust skull set her apart from the slightly sleeker classic Neanderthals. But she wasn't alone. Her DNA links to Thorin far north in France, suggesting her people roamed widely before retreating to refuges like Gibraltar. As modern humans spread, Nana's tribe faced pressure. Lena wonders, did they fight trade or love across species lines? Interbreeding happened, we know that from DNA. Maybe Nana's story isn't just Neanderthal, it's ours. As Lena packs up her tools, the sun sets over Gibraltar. She's tired, but inspired. The Neanderthals, Nana Thorin, the Elsie Drone family, weren't so different from us. They loved, fought, and dreamed under the same stars. Their extinction reminds us how fragile survival is. Small, isolated groups struggled then, and today communities cut off, whether by geography, politics, or prejudice, face similar risks. The lesson connection is our strength. Sharing ideas, genes, and stories makes us resilient, just as interbreeding may have saved Neanderthal legacy. So next time you feel alone or divided, think of Lena's Nana standing on that cliff, part of a vast human tapestry. We're all hybrids carrying ancient echoes. Let's build bridges, not walls. If you love this journey, smash that like button, share with a friend and comment. What's one way you'll connect with someone today? Subscribe for more stories from the pursuits that shape our future. Until next time, stay curious.